preaching through the book of Matthew, and um, we're at the parable of the marriage feast in Matthew 22. Such a misunderstood passage of scripture. Yeah. And yet it's as clear as the nose on your face if you simply understand the difference between the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven. I was working uh, at a factory in southeast, Mich uh, southeast Detroit one day, and uh, somehow or another I met a Christian fellow in there, because, you know, I've always got my Jesus hat on or giving away tracts or something, and somehow I met a factory worker there, and he said, hey, we have a Bible study at lunchtime. You're welcome to come if you, you know, want to and eat lunch. I said, oh, I'd be happy to, so... Sure enough, at lunchtime, I got with these two fellows. It was just two of them, and we had a little Bible study. And so I, being the guest there, they asked me to read the text for the day, and it was this passage. It was this chapter, Matthew 22. So we read this text as we were reading our lunch, and, and then after we read it, uh, the free will Baptist man said, oh, I think that's talking about a Christian that's lost his salvation. That's why he don't have his wedding garment. And, so he's throwed in the hell. And then the other guy is a missionary Baptist. He said, no, no, it's just talking about a, a man that's saved, but he's lost his good works, and so he's got to be accountable for losing his good works, but he didn't lose his salvation. And, of course, and these guys wanted to argue that point, but happily, I just happened to be in there remodeling the offices of the factory that day. So they both turned to me, and they said, well, what do you think? I said, well, you're both wrong. <laughs> <laughs> they, and they were just... They were just so sure they were right, you know. So I, I began to explain to them how, no, it's just what it says. Right. right. It's as clear as a nose on your face. But, you know, all these guys want to read into it their particular doctrines, and you, you're you not supposed to do that with the Bible. Right. 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 So let's stand and we'll read this passage of Scripture, Matthew 22, verses 1 to 14. And Jesus answered and spake unto them again by parables... And said, The kingdom of heaven is like mm -hmm. unto a certain king which made a marriage for his son mm -hmm. and sent forth his servants to call them that were bidden to the wedding, yes. and they would not come. Mm -hmm. Again he sent forth other servants, saying, Tell them which are bidden, Behold, I have prepared my dinner, my oxen and my fatlings are killed, and all things are ready. Come unto the marriage. Mm -hmm. But they made light of it, and went their ways, one to his farm, another to his merchandise. And the remnant took his servants and entreated them spitefully and slew them. But when the king heard thereof, he was wroth, and he sent forth his armies and destroyed those murderers and burned up their city. Then saith he to his servants, The wedding is ready, but they which were bidden were not worthy. Go ye therefore into the highways, and as many as ye shall find, bid to the marriage. So those servants went out into the highways, and gathered together all as many as they found, both bad and good, and the wedding was furnished with guests. And when the king came in to see the guests, he saw there a man which had not on a wedding garment. And he saith unto him, Friend, how camest thou in hither, not having a wedding garment? And he was speechless. Mm -hmm. Then said the king to the servants, Bind him hand and foot, and take him away, and cast him in outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Mm -hmm. For many are called, mm -hmm. but few are chosen. Amen. All right, let's pray. Mm -hmm. Again, Lord, we love you and we're thankful that we can rightly divide the word of truth and see clearly what's going on here. So thank you for that truth and help us to believe it now in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Have a seat there. I'll never forget one time as I was studying all these things as a younger man, Dr. Ruckman was spe speaking up at Brother Denance Church up in Flint, Michigan. And I went up there because a friend of mine was the youth pastor, assistant pastor of the church at the time. And I went up there to and spent, spent most of the day with him and then went to the service at night. And uh, at the conclusion of the service, I went up to Dr. Ruckman. I said, Dr. Ruckman, you know, we all know there's two things that's going to happen with the Lord's church 
right after the rapture. Uh, we know there's going to be a judgment seat of Christ, and there's, there's going to be a marriage supper of the Lamb. And uh, I've been researching this thing, and I can't ever find where anybody's really nailing down where this uh, wedding supper is going to be. And the more I study it, based on really this text right here, I said the more I study it, the more I think the marriage supper is not going to be held up in heaven. A lot of people think there's the rapture of the church. Then while we're in heaven, there's, of course, the judgment seat of Christ. And there's no doubt about that. Of course, there's going to be a judgment seat of Christ because there's so many people that's suddenly in heaven that weren't there before. And so there's going to be this great judgment seat of Christ for all those ma masses of people. And yet, when is this marriage supper? Is it during that time of the seven years of hell on earth when we're up in heaven? I said, the way I see it clearly, the Bible is very clear that an in, in invitation in Revelation is even given to those to come to the marriage. But then Jesus gets on the horse and he and the bride ride to the earth. And so the supper is held on the earth. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. He says, yeah, yeah, you got it right. <laughs> Dr. Rubble said, yeah, yeah, you got it right. He said, but we can't teach that. We can't. To tell everybody that because uh, most people it's just too much deep in the Bible for them and, and uh, but you got it that's what it says and then he gave me another verse or two and so it was a real blessing to me because I said wow the Lord taught me something and even Dr. Ruckman's confirmed it you know and so I was so excited uh, when Dr. Ruckman confirmed to me that here right here you got it it's just it's perfectly clear if you just can believe it you know right Obviously, one of the first things Jesus is going to do when he comes back to the earth to set up his kingdom for a thousand years, not only is he going to rebuild the temple, the first thing he's going to do is put on his work clothes and rebuild the temple. He's going to get a broom and dip it in the holy water with the ashes of a red heifer, which they got the red heifer there now, so they can do it. He's going to dip that in that water and therefore make it holy water. And then he's going to sweep down the whole area of the temple because there's been too much blood shed there, innocent blood. So he's got to sweep it all down. And then he's going to rebuild the temple because the temple's going to be destroyed. But, of course, it has to be there first. It's not there yet. Right. I bet you, though, the Jews will sneak it up within three days and three nights, don't you? Mm. When it's time to go because they got every block pre-made and sitting in a warehouse. And then the Lord's going to have the marriage supper. Now again, all he's got to do is say, Dan Harden, would you stand and ask the Lord's blessings on this food? We'll probably be there a little while. Right. I hope you don't mind your cold food being cold, you know. Because <laughs> if it's warm at all, it won't be warm when I'm done. Amen. Amen. Because I'll have plenty to thank you for. Amen. Amen. But that's one of the things that's going to happen. And this is a biblical proof of it right here. Jesus, speaking about this time of the future, when he brings in the kingdom and sets up the kingdom of heaven on earth, Jesus answered and spake unto them again by parables and said the kingdom of heaven is like, and if God was, is going to teach anything, he's going to say the word as or like. So, right. He says, is like unto a certain king which made a marriage for his son. Amen? Mm -hmm. So you got to be blind and not see it. Jesus again shared a parable. Again, we have so many clowns like Joey Faust. He don't know a, a, a parable from a hole in the ground because uh, he thinks kingdom of heaven and kingdom of God are the same. Right. No, they've never been the same. They're not spelled the same. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Heaven didn't create God. What a right. dummy. Amen. And he claims to be a Baptist preacher. I have my doubts. But Jesus again shares this parable of the kingdom of heaven, of a marriage prepared by God for his son. Now, Revelation 19, 9 does say, doesn't it? He said unto me, Right, blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he saith unto me, These are the true sayings of God. Amen. Amen. So there are those foolish Armenian preachers who think that this teaches a Christian can somehow lose their salvation. And yet, when you talk to those free will Baptist preachers, none of them seem to have ever lost their salvation. Aww. It's so funny. Right. <laughs> yeah. And yet, the uh, haughty, haughty Baptist writers 
position teaches that the guests are members of the family of God, but they're outside the body of Christ as saved non-Baptists. Who are these uh, people invited? Well, obviously there are people that's coming in then uh, from the trib. Amen. Right. The right interpretation may be difficult to attain, but the two set interpretations are clearly wrong. The king is God the Father. The son is God the Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, and the bride is the church. That's what Paul said in 2 Corinthians 11, verse 2, Ephesians 5, verses 30 to 33. And these guests appear to be the survivors of the tribulation period. And so, of course, they come in and, of course, all those that are invited are supposed to be wearing the wedding garment as proof that they were given an invitation. But if somebody wants to be a party crasher, then they can just waltz on in and work their work clothes or their street clothes, whatever. But guess what? You're going to sure stand out. <laughs> It'd be kind of stupid and foolish to put God to the test like that. The Bible warns you about putting God to the test like that. Amen. You're not supposed to test the Lord your God. So secondly, we see God's invitation is to Israel. Amen? Mm -hmm. Originally, that's who he's talking to. He sent forth his servants to call them that were bidden to the wedding, and they would not come. Again, he sent forth other servants, saying, Tell them which are bidden, Behold, I prepared my dinner, my oxen and my fatlings are killed, and all things are ready. Come unto the marriage. But they made light of it and went their ways. Mm -hmm. <laughs> made light of it. Boy, a lot of fools making mockeries of God's Bible and God's truth and God's people today, amen? They made light of it and went their ways. One to his farm. Another to his merchandise. People let their work keep them from God. Amen. Mm -hmm. People let their property keep them from God. People let their recreation keep them from God. Yeah. Amen. Man, they got to sand on that old boat and paint on it and then get all that tackle together. They ain't got time for Sunday. That's right, bro. They got to be at work on Monday. <laughs> It's a farm, it's just that, it's the other thing. The remnant took his servants and, and treated them spitefully and slew them. Man, you don't treat God like that in God's invitation. What's wrong with you? So again, we see God invited Israel, but they rejected the invitation. God showed great mercy, extended a second invitation, prepared an abundance. God saw his second invitation rejected. By a busy farmer, by a hurried businessman, by the religious, religionists and worldly who denied, scoffed, and persecuted his preachers and servants and prophets. Amen? Yes. And so there was a price to pay for that too. And when the king heard thereof, he was wroth, and he sent forth his armies and destroyed those murderers and burned up their city and certainly that was true of these Jews reject, rejecting Jesus and crucifying Jesus and come 70 AD boy they're still crying you can go to any synagogue today and they'll still be talking to you in the synagogue right here in, in, the, in, in the Gentile world of America and they talk about oh that they could have their temple back and what a loss it's been for them as a people because they don't have their temple anymore to pray and, mm -hmm. and intercede with God at and so the religionists and worldly they've denied and scoffed but God is going to properly judge them and has judged them and is continually to, continuing to judge them God judged Israel for rejecting his invitation he was out to destroy the abusers and the murderers he rejected the rejectors amen and rightfully so <laughs> right? right it's only fair God can't be unfair. And yet we see these guests going in. And of course, it's so true because, see, it's true to the Bible. Mm -hmm. See, now we're living in this dispensation of the grace of God now or in, in, during this church age where, again, his church is here and people are saved by grace through faith, plus and minus nothing. Mm -hmm. But yet there's coming a time period now, we're going to move into that seven-year hell on earth period, where we're not here, we're raptured out of here and on the earth, though God's going to pour out his wrath on this earth, and it's going to be tough, man. But as God, as always, he's going to have a remnant, though. He's going to have a remnant. 
there's going to be a few people that are going to even find our materials we're going to leave behind, and they're going to get our Bibles, and they're going to read this stuff, and they're going to be ready. And there's going to for sure be 144,000 God's going to raise up. They're going to start preaching this wonderful message. And so people will be saved. Multitudes will be saved. But that's a whole, that's a whole different tribulation church that uh, is unlike us today. Because they got to en endure the difficulties of those seven years and believe on the Lord and not take the name, number, and mark of the beast. Because if right. they do, then they're damned forever. Because right. that's going to be the pressure point. And even right now, you know, see, they don't believe the Bible. They've not read the Bible. So they're planning on putting all of us in jail as soon as they can. And they're wanting to enforce this, insert something in your right hand or forehead. And if you won't go along, then you don't, you don't need to live. We'll take your whole banking account. Of course, they, they've got to do that by going to a digital currency. So that's the next step. And it's going to happen here real soon. You know, Mr. Biden said he's going to do it by December 13th. So, so, so watch out. So we're only two weeks away. And he's going to implement this thing because, see, he don't know the Lord's coming back. He's dumb as a box of rocks, literally. Just watch him climb them stairs. Rocks are going to be mad at you. So... This world's going into this time of seven years of hell on earth, and in the end, Satan's son is going to take dominion. Nobody will do nothing unless they have his name, number, or mark in the right hand and forehead. The false prophet will make an image of the beast and make it come alive. And if you won't worship it, then you're going to have your head cut off. So that's what we're moving to. And it's good. We're moving like a freight train. It's going to be real soon. So that's why we get excited because, woo, you know, the Lord's going to rapture us out here, and they're going to rebuild the temple, and the son of Satan's going to sit down in it claiming to be God. Mm -hmm. And he'll be killing the Jews left and right. He'll be drinking their blood, eating their flesh, literally. But after he's sitting on that throne for three and a half years, it's all over. Because the Lord comes out of the sky riding a white horse and me right behind him. Mm -hmm. And we're coming back, brother. Amen. And we're not just coming back as his army, but we're coming back with, as two armies. Amen. <laughs> there was an Old Testament as well as a New Testament church. We're coming right now of that sky, Amen. brother. And we're going to rule and reign with him for 1,000 years. But now as we come back and reign with him, like Daniel tells you, it's a, it's a beautiful sight that the Lord comes back. But it's so much dirt and dust and chaos and smoke and smell of burning flesh. You give it at least, you know, 40 days to clean up the mess, and it's going to really get glorious. Mm -hmm. It's going to be a wonderful world. Amen. But he's going to rule it with a rod of iron. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people of the earth are not going to be able to handle it. He's going to get rid of the devil and the demons, but yet man's going to find out he's got a sin nature. Yes. And as much as he's trying his best, and we're helping the Lord, and we're ruling and reigning with him as mm -hmm. kings and priests, and we're trying to instruct the people, yet they're going to find within them a tendency to want to rebel and go against the Lord. And finally, the Lord will let the devil out at the end of the thousand years for a little time. And sure enough, you'll find plenty of people that rally to his cause. They will attack Jerusalem. Jesus will call down fire down out of the sky against his enemies. Then finally, we'll get to the new heaven and the new earth and new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven. And it's going to be glorious. But that's kind of the timeline of what we're headed into and where we're going. And during this time, see, when the Lord's reigning and running the world during this kingdom of heaven, when heaven is literally on earth because the kingdom of heaven is on the earth, running it, people can't handle it because he's ruling it with a rod of iron. And so we're back under the Old Testament economy. And like Zechariah 14 says, you better be ready to celebrate the king and bring a gift. Because if you don't show up at Feast of Tabernacles, man, you're in for trouble because he's going to send the plague on your country that next year. And you'll have no rain the next year. But let's go to 13, Zechariah 13. So we love Zechariah 14. And we believe in worshiping the Lord on his birthday. And every fall we celebrate Feast of Tabernacles is when Jesus was born. Amen. That's why in my house we've always made our day of gift giving not the Catholic holiday, but the American holiday of Thanksgiving. We're thankful for one another. 
The Bible over and over in Psalms says to be thankful. So because we are thankful to God and thankful for our country and just thankful all over the place for his mercies, amen. amen. What better time to give gifts than at Thanksgiving? Amen. To me, it's just logical. I wouldn't be caught dead giving a gift at Christmas time because I'd mistake I'd be afraid somebody'd mistake me as a Catholic. Right. <laughs> the Bible says avoid every appearance of evil. Amen. Doesn't it say that? Yes. So before you get to 14, though, where the Bible speaks of this wonderful day of the Lord mm -hmm. and how he's going to make sure and demand everybody come and celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles. They may not. They, they may pretend they don't know when he was born in this world today, but there's a day coming. The whole world's going to get it right for one thousand years. Amen. But let's back up to thirteen, though. The chapter before that talks some more about this wonderful time when the Lord comes back, and let's look at what it's like and see how tough it's going to be for the people of the world. In that day, there shall be a fountain opened in the house of David and to the inhabitants of Jerusalem for sin and for uncleanness. And it shall come to pass in that day, saith the Lord of hosts, that I will cut off the names of the idols. Hallelujah! Mm -hmm. You mean no more St. George Orthodox Catholic Church? <laughs> you mean no more St. Michael? You mean no more Donatello and what's the other? Uh, Michelangelo. Michelangelo and... Uh, <laughs> I'm going to cut off the names of the idols, amen, out of the land, and they shall no more be remembered. And also I will cause the prophets and the unclean spirit to pass out of the land. Hallelujah. No more Jory Smyer on television. It shall come to pass that when any shall yet prophesy, then his father and mother that begat him shall say unto him, Thou shalt not live, for thou speakest lies in the name of the Lord. And his father and mother that begat him shall thrust him through when he prophesieth. Hallelujah, buddy. We're back under the Old Testament economy. Mm -hmm. If your kid's out of line, the Bible says as his parents, you're supposed to take him, take him out, take his lights out. Take him out. You got a right to. You brought him into this world, you can take him out of this world. <laughs> if he ain't going to stay true to the faith of your fathers. Verse 4, and it shall come to pass in that day that the prophet shall be ashamed every one of his vision. When he hath prophesied, neither shall they wear a rough garment to deceive. But he shall say, I am no prophet, I am an husbandman. For man taught me to keep cattle from my youth. And one shall say to him, What are these wounds in thy hands? Then he shall answer, Those with which I was wounded in the house of my friends. Amen. Mm -hmm. yep. Isaiah 49, 15 and 16. Awake, O sword, against my shepherd and against the man that is my fellow, saith the Lord of hosts. Smite the shepherd and the sheep shall be scattered, and I will turn mine hand upon the little ones. And this shall come to pass that in now all the land, saith the Lord, two parts therein shall be cut off and die, but the third shall be left therein. And I will bring the third part through the fire. So see, of Israel, as they go into the tribulation period, and praise God, at least a third of them is going to be converted and stand up and preach the gospel and get it in the neck and get their heads cut off and to stand for God and they're going to be wiped out until finally two-thirds will be wiped out and then finally a third will be making it all the way through the end. And I will bring the third part through the fire and will refine them as silver is refined and will try them as gold is tried. They shall call on my name and I will hear them. I will say it is my people and they shall say the Lord is my God. <laughs> Amen. 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 So that's what we're looking at this time where, wow, the rules and regulations are so strict. Some kid stands up and starts saying, Go see the Lord. Man, his mom and daddy used to take a sword and kill him on the spot. Can you imagine that? That's pretty rough. That's rough. Some people ain't going to like it at all. They're not going to like it at all. Just not, too, not, just not loving and kind enough to suit them. Amen. And so it's not going to be easy. But all of a sudden, some clown's going to come in there. He ain't got a wedding. He ain't got a wedding garment on. What's going to happen to him? Well, again, what's going on is you got to remember Jesus is giving this story to his disciples. And sure enough, you got twelve disciples: Matthew, 
uh, what's, what's the disciples' name? This is the way the disciples run. Peter, Andrew, James, and John. Matthew, next, Thomas, to Philip, and Bartholomew. James, the last, and Judas, the greater. Simon, the zealot, and Judas, the traitor. Now, see, Judas is there. And always Judas called Jesus Master, but Judas never called Jesus Lord. And Jesus always, when he addressed Judas, said, friend. So as Jesus is telling the story, he says, amen, somebody's here without a garment. Verse 8, then saith he to his servants, the wedding's ready, but they which were bidden were not worthy. Go therefore into the highways, as many as ye shall find, bid to the wet marriage. So those servants went out into the highways and gathered together all as many as they found, both bad and good, and the wedding was furnished with guests. And when the king came in to see the guests, he saw there a man which had not on a wedding garment. See, he just thought he could just bully his way in there. Maybe he's talking to some of his friends, you know. He saw them take the wedding invitation, take their robe and put it on and go on in. Right. So he's just in there visiting. He's in there talking smack, whatever. But all of a sudden, see, he's out of place. He's in a place where he's not supposed to be. And like we saw where it's all red. Yeah, you can even say something out of line and get run through in that day. There was even going to be a, a place on the earth that's uh, opening to the bottomless pit to where people will be thrown straight into this pit that's on top of the earth and they'll go down into the bottomless pit, the Bible teaches. There's going to be a surface lake of fire as well as the little one at the end of this time. But look at Zephaniah chapter 1 and verse 7. Again, talking about this future time. Hold thy peace at the presence of the Lord God, for the day of the Lord is at hand. For the Lord hath prepared a sacrifice. He hath made his guests. Verse 8. And it shall come to pass, Zephaniah 1, verse 8. It shall come to pass in the day of the Lord's sacrifice that I will punish the princes and the king's children and all such as are clothed and all such as are clothed with strange apparel. Amen. Mm -hmm. The Bible talks about having on a wedding garment. Amen. And so we read, yes, when the king comes in, he sees somebody standing there without a wedding garment, and he saith unto him, Friend, how camest thou in hither not having a wedding garment? And he was speechless. Mm -hmm. See? He couldn't give an answer. <laughs> Dodo. He couldn't give an answer. You know how smart I like to say, I'm going to say this, I'm going to say that. If I stand before God someday, no, you ain't going to say nothing. Right. <laughs> you ain't going to be able to say a thing. Mm -hmm. He saith unto him, Friend, how camest thou in hither not having a wedding garment? He was speechless. Then said the king to his servants, Bind him hand and foot, and take him away. Mm -hmm. Cast him into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth, for many are called, but few are chosen. And again, many people are confused by this. People don't know. Uh, the greatest example would be uh, even uh, goofy... Uh, in the Catholic Church, you know, there's certain people through the centuries, uh, they would take these parables and they didn't know what to do with them. You know, you take a lost man reading this parable and he don't know how to handle it. Uh, and sad to say, throughout, even today, there's a lot of people, they don't know, they, they don't know what to do with this passage. It, it bothers them. And rightfully so, it should. They can't quite get it. But yet, it's perfectly clear to me because the Lord is a strict Lord, and believe you me, you got to go by the book. Amen. And God's going to go by the book. That's why he gave us the book. Right. Look at Matthew chapter 13. 
Here the Lord Jesus said in verse 42, What? The Son of Man shall send forth his angels, and they shall gather out of his kingdom all things that offend, and them which do iniquity, and shall cast them into a furnace of fire. There shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Then shall the righteous shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their Father, who hath ears to hear, let him hear. Again, the kingdom of heaven is likened to a treasure. Amen. Yes, there's coming a day people will be cast into a furnace of fire. Amen. Amen. And, of course, Jesus is going to talk a whole lot more about this in Matthew 25. Right. Where, again, he's going to talk to them about the kingdom of heaven. Mm -hmm. And what it's going to be like for so many that would be cast into that fire. And it's an everlasting punishment you know joey faust likes to go around telling christians oh you're going to be burned in the lake of fire for a thousand years then once you pay for cussing and swearing or watching bad television uh then you'll go get your mansion in heaven and he brags about this junk and i said where do you come off of that when the last verse of matthew 25 says these shall go away into everlasting punishment and yet you're telling them they're going to be punished for a thousand and then get out you got no right to tell them that amen <coughs> And he told me to my face, I don't know what to do about it. See, isn't that funny? Yes, he writes a book of over 500 pages <coughs> on the judgment seat of Christ, and there ain't that many verses on it. And I thought, how could he do? I thought, I bet you he goes through history and looks where every preacher ever said anything that sounds like it. Then he says, see, I'm not the only preacher that said this. Right. It doesn't matter how many people say it. Right. Like we right. learned in Sunday school. It doesn't matter. The lying spirit can be in a whole lot of people. You better stick with the real God and the real Bible. Amen. 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 Mm -hmm. Everlasting punishment. Nobody getting out. No. Amen. That's right. And so beware, my friend. Beware. Amen. The Bible warns us about these that would be judged by the Lord and thrown into a lake of fire. Matthew 20. Or Revelation. I mean, Revelation 20. Just remind ourselves and we'll be done. Revelation 20, verse 1. Amen. And I saw an angel come down from heaven having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. He laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is, called, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years. And cast him into a bottomless pit and shut him up, set a seal upon him that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years should be fulfilled mm -hmm. and after that he must be loosed a little season mm -hmm. amen brother there's a real hell to shun and a heaven to gain amen. And like jesus said seek ye first the kingdom of god and his righteousness and then all these things will be added to you right so god's invitation was to any and all and any and all could come good or bad he wanted to fill the house hallelujah and he filled the house the common people heard him gladly, the Bible says. Yes, but these sophisticated Pharisees, educated people, they didn't hear him. They didn't accept him. So guess what? They're like this guest that don't have a garment. He thinks he can come on in his own way. He can't come in his way. He's got to come in properly. So God entered to see his guests. He saw a man without a wedding garment. He asked only one question, and the man was speechless. God judged the man, and it was not, he was not clothed properly. Amen. He didn't have a wedding garment. Amen. He was bound. He was taken away. He was cast in outer darkness where there's weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth. The Bible often talks about hell being a place of fire and weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth. Right. And yet it says it's darkness. And of course, when we look at that, we have problems because we build a bonfire. We keep our hands warm, and especially at this time of year. We enjoy a fire. We have lots of light by the fire. And yet, we don't know how to make a fire that's a fire of darkness. But we know there is such a thing. Because when you look at the sun, and I've looked at the sun through my telescope, and when we look at the sun through the filters, we see within the sun, it's so hot inside that sun. 
that there's giant flames that burst out. And we call them what? Sun spots. Because on that surface of the sun, it's so bright, so intense with all that surface flame that we spot these black flames that come from inside the sun and burst out and make what's called sun spots. Imagine a flame that's so hot that it's black. We've seen steel turn blue, steel turn red, steel turn white. Hot. But the hottest flame is the black flame. God calls and invites many. But few are chosen. Few choose to do things God's way and accept his garment of salvation. Amen. Let's all stand by our heads in prayer. Lord, thank you for Jesus' beautiful story that was such a wonderful parallel, that, parable, I mean, parable that teaches this wonderful truth that yes, there's a heaven to gain and a hell to shun. But we'll only get there by receiving God's invitation and going God's way and receiving his garment of salvation to put on. Because, Lord, we know we're not worthy. Thank you that we have a garment to wear in heaven that's washed in Jesus' blood. And thank you, Lord, that we can stand before you spotless and clean as your bride someday. But yet, so many, Lord, have refused to believe the word. Help us to do what we can to influence them. And in Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. All right.